Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Zoran Danov, and I'm a member of the pulmonary division at University of Kentucky and also part of Pediatric Sleep uh, Center at University of Kentucky Good Samaritan Hospital. Uh, I was asked to speak, and I'm happy to talk about common sleep problem in children, including recommendation for evaluation and treatment. I have no financial interest to disclose, and uh, I uh, hope that by the end of this talk, you will able to um, recognize the normal uh, sleep in children and uh, be able to recognize the common sleep problem and to manage them mostly in your office. I specifically want to address the uh, indication for polysomnography and I hope you'll know them by the end of this talk. I'll first start talking about sleep in uh, uh, children, about normal sleep. And although we know that uh, all animals that we know of sleep, uh, we still don't understand much about sleep. I just want to mention here about unihemispheric sleep, which is a condition in which usually a migratory bird or a sea mammal is able to uh, navigate and sleep while underwater or migrating with one hemisphere asleep and another uh, awake. The function of sleep, which are uh, represented and shown on this uh, uh, slide, are uh, mostly determined from uh, a study of uh, 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 people who had some issue with sleep. And we see that it's uh, uh, important for many functions. And it's also important to uh, know that uh, many functions uh, that depend on sleep may be disrupted and in a, inadequate sleep may lead to a gamut of disorders with wide presentation outside of sleep itself. I'll start with uh, normal sleep usually the uh, uh, sleep uh, times that are required for uh, and regarded as normal sleep. On this slide, and I'm not sure whether you can see my uh, arrow, uh, on the first graph, the uh, normal sleep duration on 24 hour time day, which includes nighttime and daytime sleep like naps is represented with age on an x-axis from newborn to adulthood and time is represented on a y-axis. And you can see the widest variation between 98th centile and the second centile is in the first year of life. So in first year of life, let's say, let's take a six month old child, he ha can have normal sleep, even if he sleeps only 10 hours or on the other extreme, even if he sleeps like 18 hours or close to 18 hours of sleep. On the other uh, end of this, you can see that uh, after one year of age, the range of sleep, sleep uh, times during 24 hours or sleep duration decreases and in adulthood vary only by two uh, hours. This table represents a recommendation for American Academy of Sleep Medicine for sleep duration for adults and different ages of sleep. And also the same recommendation are given from American Academy of Pediatrics and can be found uh, anywhere on the internet. Again, it's important not only duration, but the quality of sleep, which will reflect in their uh, disturbances during the day. Uh, Another way to look at the time of sleep and duration is to know that by age of two years, uh, the child spent almost 13 months asleep and 11 months awake uh, between two and five years of uh, age, equal amount of sleep and awake. And in school age children, sleep occupies approximately 40% of 24 hour day, which means 
Sleep is the primary activity of the brain during early development. Remember, during the adulthood, it's one third of the 24 hour day. There are some sleep characteristics during the uh, development that affects uh, child, uh, child's sleep. In infants, uh, it's important to know that they learn to fall asleep on their own and also they learn to fall back to sleep on their own. So I want to put an emphasis on learn. The sleep is not given. It's a learned skill and mostly is learned by your environment and by or from your parents. As the child becomes older, becomes more independent, in toddlers and preschoolers, they, that plays a role in uh, their sleep. They transition from crib to bed and sleep problems are common. Between 25 and 30% of all toddlers and preschoolers are reported to have some sleep issue, including like uh, separation anxiety, nighttime fears. In school age children, I want to point that they are the most alert of all uh, people on earth. They have a low level of daytime sleepiness. And if you have a child in your office who is sleepy during the day, uh, look for some sleep related issues. At this age, normally circadian preference, which means whether going to sleep early or late develops. Adolescent years are very detrimental to sleep, which uh, uh, depends on many uh, normal developmental hormonal changes, social pressure and sleep phase delay, which is delayed by up to three hours. So for example, if a 12 year old has fallen asleep normally around nine, so then three hours means that he may fall asleep at midnight. In general, majority of adolescents have inadequate insufficient sleep of around seven hours, which normal average being nine hours of sleep. I'll go to the next slide. In here, uh, the sleep architecture is represented on the graph, which we call hypnogram. To explain the hypnogram, I'll uh, say that uh, on the X uh, axis, the time of the night from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. is represented, and the staging of sleep is represented in this uh, stepwise nature. So there are different stages of sleep, uh, which include non-REM sleep and REM sleep, which, in, which is dream sleep. So the sleep itself is very highly organized and structured and goes between non-REM, REM, and wake stages on a regular cycle throughout the night with cycle depending on the age of the child or person uh, cycling between 60 to 90 minutes. And there are approximately three to six cycles per night. In the same graph, I want to point that the deep sleep, slow wave sleep or non-REM sleep stage three happens in the first third of the night and REM sleep or dream sleep happens mostly in the second half of the night. And again, I want to point to this area where the child or adult uh, wakes up. And I want to point that this is normal part of the cycle. Short waking up for a couple of minutes is normal. It comes uh, into play if there is some underlying condition like in adult, maybe anxiety, depression, in children too, maybe ADHD or something that they cannot uh, shut their brain uh, and uh, uh, suit themselves back to sleep. On the next slide, there are some characteristic of both REM and non-REM sleep. Again, uh, stage one is just drowsiness. Stage three is important for you because here all the body functions, including blood pressure, heart rate and uh, Breathing are rhythmical, relaxed, and uh, in here, the, uh, the child cannot be awakened or wakes uh, with difficulties, confusion and disorientation. You can uh, probably you have experienced this when you were on call 
and fall shortly asleep, get into deep sleep or slow wave sleep, and we're called, uh, uh, awoken up by the pager, it takes a few uh, seconds to wake completely up. REM sleep is also called paradoxical sleep. Paradoxical because the brain is very active. Uh, this is where the dreaming happens, but the muscles are uh, almost paralyzed uh, not to enact the dreams. There may be a lot of muscle twitching and facial expressions. That was about uh, phases and time and duration of sleep. Uh, sleep is a phenomenon that uh, recur every 20, 24 hours, which means function on a circadian rhythm. Uh, and it's governed by two main processes, which are here schematically depicted uh, on this uh, cartoon of sleep. The first factor that determine or process that determine our sleep is called sleep load. This uh, means that as more time passes since the time we wake up, we are more and more sleepy. And you can see this downward arrow increase with uh, time since wake up time. On the other hand, alerting signal is governed by circadian uh, uh, process which depends on the uh, sunlight exposure and alertness goes up uh, highest uh, before darkness. And you can see after darkness, which signals to melatonin secretions, which is highest uh, approximately two hours after uh, exposure to dim light and then is maintained during the night. So the resultant of this Two processes, sleep load and alerting signal or circadian uh, rhythm is alertness level, which is represented by this red line. And you can see there are two regular dips or normal dips in early afternoon and early morning before waking up, usually between three and five in the morning. And then maximum alertness before going to sleep. There is one actually additional bleep, which happens 30 minutes before going to sleep, in which is contraproductive to try to put your child or your uh, patient to sleep. The next slide shows uh, the external factors that affect our circadian rhythm. And by far, uh, those are light and darkness. Light uh, function uh, through uh, retinal uh, cells uh, and uh, uh, it blocks secretion on melatonin and darkness signals sleep by uh, secreting melatonin. So light is important to know that they, it's uh, sunlight mostly in blue spectrum which all uh, our electronic devices emit. Other factors that affect uh, uh, sleep circadian rhythm are ambient temperature, noise, bedtime routine, physical activity, pain, medication, feeding, mealtime, all those affect your sleep. Circadian rhythm, sleep circadian rhythm is again not given to us, but we adjust since the birth till up to six months of age when the first time we can notice in this uh, cartoon uh, in which the time of the day is represented of an x-axis and the age of a child or a baby re represented on a y-axis. Uh, sleep is represented by black or dark uh, uh, squares and uh, awake by white squares. You can see how up to three, four months of age, there is no significant uh, circadian rhythm which is then established and the child sleeps during the day, the night, then is awake, has one uh, nap, awake, another nap, awake, and then goes for nighttime sleep. The same can be seen maybe even better in this uh, cartoon on the right, which shows newborn infant, sleep, wake, sleep, wake, sleep, wake, uh, which happened uh, randomly. And then around one year of age, 
uh, one consolidated nighttime sleep and two naps around four years of age, one nap, 10 years of age only consolidated nighttime sleep and adulthood consolidated but less nighttime sleep. So that was about normal sleep. Some points that are important for the talk. Um, how do we evaluate sleep? In primary care, you evaluate uh, sleep with a screening instrument called BEARS. And I uh, am sure that many of you are aware of this uh, uh, instrument. It has been validated in many studies that uh, evaluate the sleep uh, appropriately and sleep problems. Basically, uh, it's an acronym for questions you ask about bedtime problems, excessive daytime sleepiness, awakening during the night, regularity and duration of sleep, and snoring. Other way that we uh, evaluate sleep or sleepiness during the day uh, is a subjective measure called effort sleepiness scale. And there is one for adult and one for children that I'm giving it in here. Uh, this evaluates sleepiness in the last month and the parent or the child uh, grade their sleepiness in this eight situation, whether they, are, uh, they would never fall asleep or at, uh, uh, have high chance of falling asleep. So those are like sitting and reading, mostly idle situation when nothing is happening around. In uh, this uh, uh, example, this person has five, which is normal. You can see the normal range is zero to nine. 10 is the first mild sleepiness. Above 18 is severe sleepiness. Other subjective way of evaluating awake and uh, sleep time is by something called sleep diary in which the person over one or more uh, better uh, actually over two weeks record the time they are asleep in here. It's given with the darkened boxes, the time when they exercise here depicted by uh, E, time if they have medication, time when they uh, try to go to, to bed and to fall asleep. In here, you can see in this example, a random uh, times or bedtime and wake up time totally uh, random and not consistent, which is part of this uh, child's uh, daytime sleepiness and problems. Other more objective evaluation of sleep and wake cycle is something called actigraphy. This is similar to Fitbit, but it is very validated. Uh, wristwatch, which measure activity in here represented in this download by vertical lines and then less activity. You can see which represent sleep is given in here. In this example from uh, Friday to the next Friday a week, you can see that the sleep time, bedtime and wake time is fairly consistent. And this is a normal actigraphy report. This is used for evaluation of insomnia, hypersomnia, narcolepsy, that kind of uh, uh, conditions. Now I want to uh, uh, switch your attention to polysomnography, which is what we call sleep study. Polysomnography uh, evaluate many uh, uh, processes that happen during sleep and involves a lot of sensors. You can see on this graphic representation in here that for sleep, we evaluate EEG, eye movement, and muscle tone of the chin. For breathing, we use uh, uh, elastic belts around the chest and around the belly, pulse oxygen, and then uh, monitoring of nasal flow and entitled carbon dioxide. We also monitor uh, EKG because the heart may be affected by uh, sleep disorders. And also in here, I don't know when uh, you can see, uh, we check for leg movement with uh, two sensors on both legs. So it's uh, extensive, lasts the whole night, 
not many children can do it. It's very important to explain that to the parents, explain that to the children. It's better if they can visit the sleep center where they'll have uh, a sleep study to accommodate themselves, to know where they are going. But uh, that's mostly impractical. So I recommend them to go online and on YouTube, they can easily find a uh, pediatric sleep study. All other centers have the explanation what happens during the sleep study. And uh, the sleep study is highly uh, governed and structured uh, and uh, are all the same everywhere. The environment may be different. So that's about the sleep study. But what are the indications for the sleep study? So the first and most important for you to know is sleep disorder breathing, any apnea, uh, central apnea, obstructive apnea, hypoventilation, all those are sleep disorder breathing, our main indication for polysomnographic study. The second indication is something called periodic limb movement disorder, which is different from less leg syndrome. Periodic limb movement disorder is uh, uh, rhythmic, phasic movement of the limbs that disturbs sleep and may manifest with daytime sleepiness or behavior problems. Restless legs is complain before going to sleep or on a waking up about restlessness of your legs. 80% uh, of people with uh, restless leg may have periodic limb movement disorder, but periodic limb movement disorder may uh, exist on its own. Uh, we also use polysomnographic study for evaluation of hypersomnia, which means sleepiness during the day, which will be followed then polysomnographic study by multiple sleep latency tests the next day. Polysomnographic study is not indicated for evaluation of parasomnia, insomnia, or restless leg syndrome. Of course, if you suspect comorbid sleep disorder or seizure disorder, yes, then you may ask for seizure montage polysomnographic study or for uh, polysomnographic study to evaluate for those additional disorders. Now I'll uh, uh, turn to common sleep disorders and I'll talk briefly about several and uh, I urge you to ask me questions and at the end of the talk I have my email address. Please email me with questions or concern or if you have any patients to refer or asking about a uh, condition that you experience in your patients. So first I want to point that uh, sleep depends on many factors that may be individual to the person like genetic predisposition, environment or parenting skills and a com uh, comorbid like medical conditions, psychiatric disorders and also depend on the age of the child Infant has different characteristics like immature nervous system. So we'll have different sleep uh, disorders, have compliant chest wall, has increased REM sleep. All those will affect the infant differently than toddler who has efficient sleep, but adenotosial hypertrophy is very common. Uh, and the, this is the stage of rapid cognitive def development or adolescent in which there are a lot of uh, delayed sleep phase hormonal influences, social influences, and substance abused. So the common uh, problem in infant will be apnea of prematurity, infant apnea, sudden infant death syndrome, and sleep onset association disorder. I want to point that all disorders like sleep onset association can happen in any age, but are more common in infant. In toddler, the same parasomnias, which are very common, and then sleep disorder breathing in adolescent, mostly insomnia, sleep disorder breathing, excessive daytime sleepiness, that kind of disorders. So I'll uh, start talking about the first common disorder, one of the commonest sleep disorders in children and in adults, but different types. Uh, insomnia means difficulty falling asleep and basically difficulty staying asleep may manifest with uh, uh, bedtime refusal, crying during the night, coming to parents' bedroom, different manifestation. It's important to know that uh, the duration should be at least three months and then that it leads to daytime impairment. 
in children by the newest uh, classification, which is third edition of International Classification of Sleep Disorders. Uh, chronic insomnia of childhood has subtypes like sleep associ onset association type and limit setting type. The most common adult insomnia that is may happen in children is uh, uh, insomnia called uh, psychophysiological insomnia in which inability to fall asleep leads to worrying and anxiety about inability to fall asleep and daytime functioning and uh, makes a vicious circle that leads to significant insomnia. Daytime impairment, when we talk about the children, we need to remember that most of the time it will be parental impairment, especially if it's younger children and toddler. Behavior or uh, insomnia of childhood, sleep onset association type, basically means that the child is used to fall asleep in certain way in which demands the caregiver to be present. And then when the child wakes up normally during the night because the parent is not there, the child will demand the same things to happen and have no difficulty, has no difficulty falling back to sleep when those demands are fulfilled. The typical scenario will be 11 month old who falls asleep by rocked in uh, his mom's arms and then wakes up multiple times during the night and needs uh, his or her mom to come and rock the baby back to sleep. You have probably have uh, seen that in your children. One variant of this is uh, a baby that uh, learns to fall asleep with a bottle and wakes up and asks for a bottle when actually you know that they are not hungry. Key uh, point in treatment is to teach the child to sleep independently. And here is education of the parents and also the use of transitional object that will be helpful like a teddy bear or blankie, whatever works for the family. Behavior insomnia of childhood limit setting type is exactly what it says. There are no limit setting set by the parents during the daytime or the nighttime and it manifests usually with the child asking for another story, asking another hug, asking another water, asking another uh, use of bathroom and this drags on for hour or hours. This also because the child may associate it falling asleep with those activity may happen even later when the child wakes up. The the uh, treatment of this kind of insomnia is uh, again education and explaining the parents that they need to set limits and uh, help them set the limits for the child, come to some limits together with them and maybe involve the child and also very important to uh, find some sort of reward system if the child falls asleep, fell, uh, falls asleep on uh, their own or uh, don't disturb the parents during the night and just uh, giving uh, uh, stars or stickers in the mornings is sufficient. So those two insomnias are also common and more pronounced in children with ADHD uh, and autism spectrum disorder and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, so uh, the, I think one of the slides is missing, but anyway, uh, this happens because children with ADHD uh, cannot uh, uh, wind down uh, properly. They cannot uh, slow down. Children with ASD uh, have difficulty with uh, uh, communication. Uh, they, have, they may have their own rituals. Uh, all that contributes to uh, behavior insomnia, uh, behavior insomnia in, of childhood being more pronounced and uh, require more intense treatment. Uh, the other sleep conditions, including uh, obstructive sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome or periodically movement disorder, 
or sleep phase disorder are not more common in children with ADHD uh, and ASD. The treatment is mostly, again, behavior intervention, like uh, uh, evaluate and treat comorbidities, uh, treat ADHD, maybe need sedative, if there is anxiety, if there is something else that it needs to be treated, not necessary with medications. Sleep hygiene is also in, in, uh, important and including sleep environment, positive bedtime routines, behavior interventions and cognitive strategies are outside of the scope of this talk and uh, are mostly uh, given by behavior specialist or uh, uh, sleep behavior specialist. Part of the sleep hygiene measures include diet, uh, and you probably all know and parents know when they come to me that uh, they always avoid high caffeinated uh, uh, beverages like chocolate or cola. Uh, studies have shown that uh, uh, diet uh, with fruit, vegetable, rice and meat lead to less behavior problems and better sleep. Physical activity, yes, it's very important for children to be involved in physical activity, will make them tired. But know that in, this, uh, in children with uh, neurodevelopmental issue, ASD and ADHD, uh, it, the play should be limited uh, to three hours prior to bedtime because it will interfere. They'll have trouble binding down. You should engage the child in binding down activity and quiet, relaxing activity. And of course, no television or electronics at least one hour prior to sleep time. Sleep environment, on the other hand, uh, includes comfortable bed. Many uh, children with sensorineural issues will like softer bed in which they can mattress, in which they can sink in. Uh, some of them require so-called weighted blanket. The room should be quiet and dark or lightly lit uh, if the child uh, needs some light. Room temperature neutral or many will prefer cold temperature like even 68 Fahrenheit degrees and bedroom should be used only for sleep. Parents should not use the bedroom for punishment and that shouldn't be a main uh, room where the child spend a lot of time playing or uh, for other activities in the bedroom. Positive bedtime routine involve consistency, consistent wake up time, consistent bedtime, and very important, consistent bedtime routine, which means same activities in the same way each night. It's important to give the, the child step-by-step -step instruction or written, spoken, or even uh, as a pictures, what is expected of them. The each activity usually recommended are three to four up to five activities that will transition the child from wakefulness to sleep. There should be enough time. The uh, children shouldn't be rushed through them, but shouldn't be too much time uh, so the child is more involved in the activity. Those are some uh, schedules like picture schedule, in which uh, putting on pajamas, using toilet, all those the child can see it and uh, the parent can or the child uh, himself, depending on the development, can check those marks. Reading stories, especially stories about going to bed of other children or animals are found to be uh, helpful and communicate expectation that the child is supposed to go to sleep. A uh, great source for parents, a doctor, is uh, Autism Speaks, uh, Autism Treatment Network. This is uh, their booklet as a parental guide to sleep problem in children with autism, but I've used it in children with ADHD or other neurodevelopmental issue. Also, I will refer you to this, uh, uh, should be baby sleep, uh, I misspell it, uh, dot com in uh, by pediatric sleep council uh, which is put up by pediatric sleep specialist including behavior sleep specialist and uh, many 
advices can be find, uh, found there for the provider or for the parents. I'll briefly talk about pharmacological intervention for behavior insomnia in childhood. I want to mention that in otherwise healthy children, no need for any pharmacological intervention. I also want to make clear that at present, there is no medication approved for pediatric sleep by FDA. If you decide that the child needs some medication, the treatment should be combined with the behavioral intervention and usually used as a bridge for the uh, success of the behavioral intervention and shouldn't be a long time, maybe a couple of months, three to four months. Uh, and we know that many children take prescribed sleep medication, quarter of them, and who knows how many children take melatonin and other over-the-counter sleep medications. I'll mention two most commonly used. Again, there are no randomized control study, but there is some empirical evidence that clonidine work in decreasing the sleep onset latency. There are some uh, issue with it. Uh, it's more important to start low and taper it up slowly. And then when you taper it down before, taper it down before you discontinue it. Uh, clonidine also decreases REM sleep and may uh, be affected by other medication or have some interaction. So you need to check for that. Side effects, mostly low blood pressure and weight loss. Withdrawal effects are shortness of air, tachycardia and high blood pressure. Melatonin, which many people call vitamin M because it's so widely used, um, is, uh, has two property used for by sleep uh, specialists. One is hypnotic effect and the other is shift in circadian phase. As a hypnotic effect is given 30 minutes prior to bed, most recommendation go to start with one milligram and titrate it up every five to seven days in children with ADHD, neuro behavior issues, neurodevelopmental issue, autism, the maximum dose may be up to 10 milligrams. And uh, it's not recommended uh, for children below age of three. Uh, there are some side effects, usually uh, not on a short term, but low term side effects include lowering uh, seizure threshold, asthma exacerbation, and delayed onset of puberty. So you still need to be cautious when you prescribe that or suggest that as a treatment. Parasomnia, I think, are well known in the pediatric community and by primary care providers. Uh, they uh, represent events or experiences that happened around or during sleep. There are two main types, including partial arousal parasomnias, which happens during uh, non-REM sleep in which the child act as awake but is actually asleep, and then parasomnia associated with REM sleep, including nightmares, sleep paralysis, and REM sleep behavior disorder. REM sleep behavior disorder is mostly a uh, disorder of adults. In children, can be seen uh, as an influence of some medication. In essence, it's an acting of <coughs> sorry, sleep. Uh, dreams uh, because of inadequate sleep paralysis. Uh, confusional or partial arousal parasomnias uh, has the same characteristic in nightmares. I choose them as a, a REM sleep behavior uh, uh, parasomnia. Uh, and those are differences between nightmares and sleep terrors. And my experience with talking to medical residents, providers, is the most of you know all those differences and can easily differentiate uh, one from another. The next topic I want to uh, talk about that is common is pediatric obstructive sleep apnea. In here, I'll spend several slides just to mention that obstructive sleep apnea is at the top 
end of a spectrum of condition which relative decrease in upper airway obstruction, primary snoring or um, some call it uh, habitual snoring in the first of the spectrum and that progresses through upper airway resistance and obstructive hypoventilation to obstructive sleep apnea, each one uh, manifesting with more and more uh, disturbed sleep and changes in ventilation and also daytime uh, consequences. Obstructive sleep apnea depends on several factors which are shown in this Venn diagram, mostly the patency, the size of the upper airways, uh, the neuromuscular tone, the especially of pharyngeal muscles and other factors including hormonal, uh, we know that is uh, more common in males adult and uh, equally common in postmenopausal uh, women and adults, older adults. Uh, so no one factor determines uh, whether you have obstructive sleep apnea or not. Those are common conditions that lead to obstructive sleep apnea and those children you should be aware to always ask about symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, so you can see Down syndrome, neuromuscular diseases like cerebral palsy, uh, some craniofacial abnormality in here you don't see it but commonly Pierre Robin manifests like that and more and more nowadays obesity. Adenotonsillar hypertrophy may cause obstructive sleep apnea but doesn't mean that if the child has tonsillar hypertrophy that they have sleep apnea even if they snore. Those are night time and daytime symptoms of uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, nighttime, loud snoring, apneas, snorting, gasping, choking, restless sleep, and diaphoresis, the most common that are observed by parents. Daytime symptoms, I want to point out that behavior, school problems, ADHD type behavior are more common in preschool and school age children, while daytime somnolence happens mostly in children during their teenage years and in uh, adolescence. How do we diagnose obstructive sleep apnea? The gold standard is polysomnographic study. There is no combination of uh, uh, history from the history of physical finding to reliably tell you that the child has sleep apnea. On the other hand, you also need to qualify it or and quantify it how bad it is. So polysomnographic study is essential for diagnosis and also it will uh, evaluate for success of the treatment. Surgical uh, treatment is the most common treatment for pediatric obstructive sleep apnea. It's the first line treatment. Tracheostomy is the last resort uh, in which uh, the upper airway, which is a problem in sleep apnea, is bypassed. Non-surgical treatment include continuous positive airway pressure. We have many children after tonsillectomy with residual sleep apnea that continue to have sleep apnea are on continuous positive airway pressure. And in here, I want to point that in children who have mild sleep apnea, intranasal steroid with Montelukast or separately have been shown to have some effect in decreasing uh, obstructive sleep apnea and is given, as I said, for mild sleep apnea. Uh, uh, if we decide to, to proceed with the surgery, we need to know that there is a group of children that are high risk for post-operative complication and you need to uh, suggest to the families that they should be done in a center with uh, availability for overnight stay for observation. Those children include young children, severe obstructive sleep apnea found by uh, PSG, or some associated medical condition, including neuromuscular disorders, respiratory infection, severe obesity of, or prematurity. 
I forgot to mention in a previous slide in the risk of obstructive sleep apnea, African-American children and premature children are also at higher risk for obstructive sleep apnea. The guidelines for American Academy of Pediatrics for obstructive sleep apnea is to screen all children for snoring, to refer a complex patient to a specialist, to do a polysomographic study for diagnosis, and perform adenotonsillectomy with inpatient monitoring of high-risk patient. And every child should be re-evaluated after the, the surgery. Usually, it's sufficient to take the history. And if there are residual snoring, uh, same symptoms present uh, as before the surgery, then refer them for repeat polysomographic study. The last uh, topic that I'll address today is uh, also commonly seen in primary care, and I see a fair amount of these children with increased daytime sleepiness in adolescence, teenager years. Most of the time, most of the time by far, this is caused by insufficient sleep and then other possible sleep disorders are sleep apnea, restless leg, insomnia, delayed sleep phase disorder, and narcolepsy. Again, those are less common, but you should screen for those too, to be sure. In case you are not, you can always refer to a sleep center to be evaluated. Those are some factors that affect adolescent sleep. As we said, normally, uh, there is a delayed sleep phase. There may be some genetic predisposition, uh, changes of uh, hor uh, different hormones that uh, start. Then uh, obesity is common there. School start times, which are not adjusted to reflect the delayed sleep phase. Substance abuse is not uncommon in this age. And then a lot of social pressure. Many uh, Sleep providers refer to adolescence and the perfect storm for insufficient sleep. Those are some so-called uh, sleep stealers across the childhood, mostly involve electronics, electronics in the bedroom like TV, computer, any internet access, cell phones, text messaging, all that uh, takes time from sleep, caffeine, beverage over scheduling like uh, we've seen in many high schoolers they'll have uh, uh, after school activities or they'll have part-time work they'll come home 9 or 10 p.m then uh, do their homework and they simply don't have enough time for sleep one uh, slide that I want to share with you are about potential uh, effects and mechanisms how the electronics affect uh, your sleep. And in red, the mechanisms are highlighted. So first, using uh, electronics just displays your sleep, so you have less time for sleep. Media also may cause increased mental uh, or emotional or physiologic arousal, anxiety, depression. Um, and then, as mentioned uh, in the introduction, bright light exposure delays the circadian rhythm that is already delayed and all this will lead to sleep problem, decrease or restricted sleep and impaired daytime functioning will be mostly manifest with them sleeping during the morning classes at school. I think this is the last slide about general sleep hygiene principles. So uh, well-known, but uh, worth uh, repeating, no caffeinated beverage, especially in the evening or six hours prior to going to sleep, regular time of bedtime, wake time and meals, regular physical activity, quiet, dark room and comfortable temperature. Uh, don't use the room or bedroom for punishment uh, and no electronics before bedtime. Those are some of the conclusions. Uh, greatest period of maturation of sleep is in the first years of life. The amount of sleep needed in childhood 
do not dramatically drop in adolescents. Sleep disorders are common in primary care setting, but most of them can be diagnosed on the base of clinical presentation and can be managed by primary care provider. Polysomnographic study is indicated for evaluation of sleep apnea, periodic limb movement disorder, and hypersomnia. And sleep restriction, insufficient sleep time, is new epidemic with uh, affecting the children, especially adolescent, with cognitive, emotional, and medical uh, condition and problems. So in here is my email address. Please do not hesitate if you have any questions or if you have any uh, you, if you're a patient that you want to discuss what's the best next step, uh, email me and I'll respond as soon as I receive your email. Thank you again and uh, I hope you uh, learned a few things about sleep and sleep problems today. Those are some of the references that I used for today's talk and again I I refer you back to those uh, two slides about uh, babysleep.com and Autism Treatment Network for more in-depth uh, advices. Thank you.